I've got a I've got a couple of emails from our our friend Jim. And he got a really nice email back. He respects you so much. Let him know. Right with us. That's nice to hear. Well, I don't think he say anything. I know. Well, they recognize this one. No, I didn't. Call accepted. Thank you. At the tone, please record your message. When you've finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. John and G7, if we could have you please mute your phones. If you're satisfied with the message, press 1. To listen to your message, press 2. To erase and re-record, press 3. To continue recording where you left off, press 4.
Christy, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay. And I guess uh, with this microphone and that, sounds like when we click our pens and things like that, it's quite loud. Um, our voices are pretty medium, but the extra ancillary sound is going to be quite okay. So we'll be careful with that. Evening, Council Secretary. Council, Madam Mayor, everybody. All right, uh, I'm going to call the July 7th, 2021 Council meeting uh, to order. And um, we do have the uh, visitor section coming up. We will take uh, visitors via emails to chat at chat suite at cityofgerhardt.com uh, and I will, will roll call as well through there. Um, is there any declaration of conflict of interest? No. Um, no. Except for being married to one of the women who really um, Approval of minutes, uh, special meeting of, or excuse me, regular meeting of June second, twenty twenty one. Any comments? I move to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, motion carry special meeting June 8, 2021. I so moved. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And no opposition. Planning uh, commission report is in the packet and we have any business. With regard to that. Any other comments? Um, Planning report. Or accepted as written. Mayor's report. I'm going to keep my report brief and just uh, outline the meetings that I did this month. I met with the business committee. Um, with Brent, uh, and we scheduled a work session uh, that will be forthcoming uh, for the council to go over their survey results. Uh, we, I attended the Parks Master Plan. They have uh, drafted the goals for the Parks Master Plan and are uh, uh, finishing a priority uh, goals list or yeah, project list almost. Um, I've met with Chad weekly three times. I uh, skipped out yesterday. Um, I met with Councillor Rita uh, on the tree issue. I met with Brent on uh, the business committee uh, survey. Um, and I met with Carrie on uh, other, some other issues with. Uh, with regard to our roles in uh, as council and or mayor and council president. I attended a meeting on mental health challenges in Clutch County with uh, uh, Senator Wyden. Uh, Chief Bowman was also in attendance at that meeting. Uh, and that was very good to listen about possible uh, federal funding for uh, programs such as that. Eugene Cahoots model. Uh, he seemed quite taken with that. Um, I attended the Gearhart Homeowners Association annual meeting. I rode on a fire truck in the break. Quite a fun experience. And I uh, uh, we had the Calvary Book session on homelessness, parking, and camping. My report. Council reports. Uh, Council report. 
we took a big chunk of wine with the uh, small business committee, but I will uh, add a few things. Um, so our, our committee is comprised of Andrew Stein, Jimmy Frank, both of them are business people here, here part. Uh, also, we have uh, Jessica Newhall from Cedar and the Small Business Development Center uh, as a member. Uh, she has just announced that she's needing to step off of the committee, so we're down to three. Um, let's see. Oh, I wanted to pass along some great news. My wife and I were walking along the ridge path and taking little detours through the neighborhood. And we ran across a home under construction, and it wasn't there just weeks before. And I was just blown away that this thing had been built so quickly. And so I struck up a conversation with the builder was from Portland, 40 years in the business. I asked him how he liked working with the city of Gerhardt. And he said, oh my God, this is a dream city. Uh, I've never worked with a building department that has been more easy to work with than Gerhardt. I love it here. I want to build here forever. <laughs> so yeah, I told him. That probably won't happen because there's not that much land left forever. But anyway, so I wanted to pass that along no, to the so. development department. So that's it. Hey, Carrie. Uh, I met with the mayor about some issues, and uh, that'd be about all I got to report. Great. I met with Chief Bowman today for about an hour discussing the Ordinance 660 and all the uh, impact and ramifications that it had and some resolutions. And we had a real healthy discussion about the issue of overnight parking and tents. And uh, it was really informative and I learned a lot. I really was glad to meet with him. That was it. I have nothing. Okay, city staff reports. Um, Mark, you want to go first? I can. Yeah. Bear with me as I try to read off the, my notes I got here. But, you know, I can start by saying it's, uh, it's been an interesting year for us for Public Works. Uh, I've been here 22 years now, and I don't think the Public Works Department's ever been busier. You know, we've dealt with all the COVID stuff. We had some staff issues. Uh, we've got a new worker, um, which I'm happy to say I've never had a better crew, I don't think, as long as I've been here either. They don't know as much as they should yet, but they're learning and they're willing to take that on. And uh, I'm really happy to have what we have. I'd like to get them trained and get them going as much as I can to help the city. I mean, I, it's, uh, it's been a long time coming in that aspect of things. So, and I'm going to go over a few things with the water plan and what's going up on up there. I mean, believe it or not, it's over 10 years old now. Um, things, things are starting to break more. Things are starting to wear out. It's, it's going to be a constant. It's going to cost more money. Uh, we used, we made more water in June than we've ever made ever. So almost a million gallons more in the month of June. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with more people staying here in town, more building, all of the above. So it's, it's you know, all in all, everything's working pretty well. I mean, we did that rebuild with the uh, with the manifold systems and got it open and found out there was a lot more wrong there than what we had anticipated. As far as the tanks, the epoxy was um, going bad. So we had to, uh, there were spots I had to weld up, crawling those tanks and weld up. Uh, it's just normal wear and tear, you think about it. I didn't believe it was over 10 years old, but the epoxy goes bad, it wears out. So. That took longer than we anticipated because the dry time on that stuff is like it's about 10 days because it's special drinking water approved. That's 
certain cure. But uh, all in all, it went really well. Everything went together pretty well. And we got it up and going just in time for when we're in April, May, June is our biggest water months, just because, of course, here in July we're regulated and then we have to use warm water. Water on as of July 1st, which we go from making 600 gallons a minute one day and the next day we're down to 200 gallons a minute. So that's just kind of the way it is. Um, there's some other things we're working on up there as far as moving forward. There's like 20 valves on each one of those machines and they all have air actuated you know, valves. And uh, those are starting to leak a little bit. The O-rings wear out over time. So we have to get those rebuilt and start changing some of those out. Uh, I've had to send in some of the chemical feed pumps because those are getting wore out and it was easier to rebuild them than it was to buy new ones because those are like, a, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six of them running up there. And they're like, I think they're like eight, ten thousand dollars a piece. So they're not cheap. Nothing in that place is cheap. Uh, the hardest part is what we've been dealing with over the last year is getting anything. Everything we get is specialized from distribution to treatment to anything. We're getting anything done. We're lucky enough to be able to do a lot of that work ourselves, which other places would hire out. We can't, we can't get it here. So I mean, we even at a point where there was a shortage of water pipe because they couldn't make the water pipe quick enough. They blamed it on all those freezing temperatures and stuff in Texas and told us they couldn't get us pipe. They will not give us a price on water pipe more than a day in advance. So that's how quick it changes. Um, last month, there was a chlorine shortage. There's a lot of cities in Oregon right now that are scrambling because they can't get the chlorine to put the water. Um, the main plant that produces the chlorines in Longview and they had their main transformer blue and they couldn't get it up and running. I was told yesterday they finally got it. But luckily, we produce our own chlorine. So we weren't as affected as much. But there are a lot of cities that are. So. Along with the plant being 10 years old, I've been in contact with my controls people up in Portland, which is Taurus Controls. And they're probably the best company I've worked with in 10 years as far as doing stuff for me and getting it done. And they're recommending the upgrade computer system and our control system. Because over the years, there's a lot of stuff I don't need on there, we found out, as far as SCADA. And there's some things I'd like to add to make it better. And this is going to include you know, backups uh, and new security systems because security is changing every day too. There have been some water plants that were infiltrated by people. I think we found out later, most of it comes from ex-employees that are happy. So, but um, we don't really have a lot of those to worry about. So, uh, so they're looking at a whole new system. They've got two or three up and running right now in the state, and they want to implement that with me. But as far as my programmer, he, I mean, this guy answers his phone in the middle of the night from the text. He can fix things for me, he does it instantly. I've never had a company that good that has done that for us. He's been a real asset for us as far as the city. Because if that computer and stuff goes down, I can't do anything. We're done. So we need to get that upgraded and, and uh, spend some money there and, and look at that lasting another 10 years, hopefully. So. We've had some issues the last few months with our transducers. We have seven uh, monitoring transducers around town, three major ones out in the dunes. These are the things that tell us whether we're pulling in salt water or not or we're doing harm to the groundwater. It's funny, you got all these people saying we're in a drought, we're in a drought. And according to my transducers and all the data, we're not. It hasn't changed that much in the groundwater, as far as the groundwater is concerned. But I had to replace the three out in the dunes. And uh, that information is sent every year to our geologists. And they put, we have to do a report for uh, the groundwater. WRD once a year that has to be done based on all of these reports and these uh, data loggers in the ground. 
And believe it or not, those lasted almost 15 years. And manufacturing that sells them to us, and their lifespan is like five. So we got our life out of those. So uh, we've been monitoring that every day. And I think it takes a reading. Well, those ones take a reading every two hours. And there's one in the crit that takes a reading every 15 minutes. So it's a lot of work to get all that data together and calculate. I mean, it takes two or three days every month of our time to take care of that stuff. That's really all I got on the treatment plan right now. I mean, all in all, everything it's running, but it, we do a lot to make it run. It doesn't run itself. I guarantee you that. There's a lot of work and a lot of maintenance that goes on with it. It's becoming more and more every day. So. I'm going to move on to the distribution system a little bit as we're moving forward. The hardest part this year is. As you guys know, there's not a lot of lots left. And the lots that are left are complicated. It's really hard to get them water. They're farther away from the water mains. They're uh, trees in the way, bushes, and people are as the lots get less and less. They're starting to develop the ones that were too complicated to build on to begin with. So that's been kind of a struggle. We put in more services this year than I think I ever have. So. We've done a few main extensions, and that's just been kind of a tough situation. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's, we're putting a lot of this money. I don't think we did so as much in the past, you know, 20 years ago, because they weren't as hard to get to, but we try to make the contractor responsible for as much, you know, if it's above and beyond what we have to pay for. We got to get a contractor in here to do a like bore underneath the highway or whatever. I mean, they're going to have to cover some of that. So. This next upcoming months, I mean, we have probably 200 valves in the ground that it's been two years since they've been turned and located and all that stuff. We like to try to keep those on every year. So my guys are going to be out the next couple months, finding them all, locating them, exercising them with the machines we have. We have our factor. You can suck out the boxes and exercise them. It's kind of boring, tedious work, but it's got to be done. It's, you get a main break or something, and it's underwater. You want to know where those valves are at and be able to shut people off without flooding their houses or washing out the highway. It's amazing how much damage 12 inch broken water main on the highway do within a matter of minutes so we've worked you know we've been working really hard in the last three or four years to try to install more valves because years ago they were cheap they, you know we only need one valve well you might have a mile between valves which of course the more valves we have we can isolate people's houses and shut off stuff so we're not getting more people out of water at the same time and be able to isolate better so we're trying to spend more money doing that and, and get that taken care of. Um, I've got a few water main projects in my mind that I want to get done. Every year I try to eliminate some of the dead end lines or, or some of the old plastic or you know, steel lines that, that need upgraded. So every year I try to do at least one or two big projects um, where we do an extension or and I have a couple in mind that I'm not there yet. Here. We're working as hard as we can on getting the meters in place. That's been a priority, but that again took a hit with COVID. Uh, people didn't want us knocking on their doors and messing with the meters, and people were afraid to even see us. Right? And it was, but, and I've hired a couple of companies to do it. They do work, they do it good for a while, and then they're just out. They're like, no, we don't want to do it anymore because you're going to drag down. So I, I got to find some other way of getting the rest of these installed. Problem is, by the time we get installed, we're back to square one because some of them are five years old now. So you're going to have to start replacing them again. So it's it's going to be a nonstop. We've spent almost four hundred thousand dollars in place meters, and I'd say we're 80, 90 percent there. But it's going to start all over again. Meters have a life, ten years. So I think some of them are eight years old. So. 
We've got some larger ones we're going to try to replace here in the next couple months. Uh, like there's a three inch one on Windward condos I haven't got to yet. Uh, there's uh, like uh, a wind jammer on the highway. That one's we just done that one up. Priorities to get some of these bigger ones done and use a lot of water. But it takes it takes time. You've got to get permits, especially if you're on the highway, the state requires certain things. And it's, we're getting there. But in the middle of all that, you know, we try to get something done, we get called off for this and that and everything all day long. So it's just that I feel like I've been chasing the tail. We have, and that gets me on the kind of water conservation. We have a water conservation plan we had to enact when we started this plant. Well, we have to do an amendment, not an amendment, but a, an update on And that's due in the spring of next year. And I've been working with uh, Kennedy Jenks and the gentleman that originally did our first one. Thank goodness he was, he's still there. I thought he'd be retired by now, but he's agreed to look into getting that updated for us and get that done because that coincides with our water rights. So they're getting really sticky now. The EPA and the nations, they, I mean, water conservation has become a huge thing. So. We don't have as big a problem here, but if you see some of the news in some of the other places in the country and the state, like, uh, I think they were talking about the Hoover Dam, the water there would be lower than it's ever been. They're shutting down power plants in California because of the low water. So it's just between that building, it's, uh, it's become an issue. So we're at just the uh, I'm waiting back on some bids for prices for him to get that done for us and work together and hopefully that can get done with no problems. That gets me on to some of the street stuff. Uh, my guys have been out. I mean, this time of year, there's so much mowing. And I mean, you can mow and turn around and the next day it's back again. And we try to keep up with it along with everything else. Uh, the last couple of days, my guys have been down in fifth trying to cut all that brush back down there. And so we could, we could cut brush every day, all day, and still not catch up. So, so we try to do the best we can to keep up with it. Um, we've been, you know, every year I try to do some uh, paving in different sections and need overlays of, of spots that are bad. Uh, I've been in contact with the local pavers here and, and trying to get some of that done before winter. I'm looking at getting some prices on maybe getting some of the sidewalk over here upgraded. It's been a long time. Some of it's cracking and I just don't like it. We could, we could do better over there, I think. Um, probably get rid of the strip of grass that's just weeds and make it look like the new world over here where it looks a lot nicer. There's some other sidewalks that I have in mind. It's a uh, problem. Getting some of this done, it's, everybody is so busy right now, it's hard to get anybody to play back or do anything. It's crazy. It's, it. it's the same story with every contractor I talk to. It's like we have more work than we know what to do. So we all know that comes back down again, but it will. But uh, uh, we're, uh, this is the time of year, too. We're out, you know, all the catch basins in town. They all got to be cleaned up, dug out. Uh, make sure they're operating properly, the inflows, the outflows of all of them. Problem with all the building that's going on is that water has you get, it's more to go. So everybody keeps filling and filling and filling, and we got more water in town. We get more complaints about you know standing water and such. And some of it is just you know, it don't stop screaming. There's really nothing I can do about it. So I wish I could, but you know, there's only so many things. Years ago, we used to put in these dry wells and stuff, and they last six months they just don't they won't take the heavy rains but once it stops raining it usually dissipates into the ground but a lot of these drainages that went on to people's property that are built on now and what they did in the past really wasn't but all in all we do pretty well but if we don't get them cleaned out and everything it makes our job harder in the winter we spend Probably two, three hours a day, at least one of my guys just going around and cleaning pine needles on our kitchen so, so people don't flood out. 
Can you give an example? Are you talking about the things that are? Yeah, yeah, metal grates in the road. Yeah, all those have to be dug out because they fill up with pine needles and plug them, plug the drains, they plug the drains in there, and it's hard to get them. So we we have you know we'll go out with our back dirt and, and suck them out. The larger ones I usually get clean sweep over here with this big machine that to help out at some points. But if it doesn't get done every year, we wouldn't drain it. So but it's just a yearly yearly thing we do. If, you know, they pull the grass over in two, so you gotta get the grass off when we pull in the grapes. And it's like I said, it's just an annual thing. So general maintenance we do to keep things green hopefully. Right. Uh, we're also, you know, it's nice out. So we're out, you know, we've been I've got a bunch of striping done. We start replacing markers on the roads when it's nice. Some of these crosswalks need replaced. It's all things we gotta do when it's sunny out and get done. Hopefully, crosswalks and such. We've always, we've always tried to wait till like September because usually people went back to school and went home. It didn't happen last year, but I'm hoping now the school's back open, it'll slow down a little bit in September as far as the streets. And you know, I know we need garbage cans around town, but they are my least favorite thing that I do here. So because people stuff them with all their home garbage, they uh, and it's it's just a constant nightmare. But it, and it takes up a lot of work. But we we rely on a lot of the the folks around town that walk around in the morning. Um, a lot of them, I, I know a couple of them, they'll call me and say, "Hey, this garbage can's full or whatever," before I even get to work. So it's. Uh, it's nice to have a few of them that let us know. I can't be everywhere all the time, but we will empty them and leave for an hour, and I swear it's filled back up again. <laughs> so, um, that's where I'm at with streets. It's kind of, you know, we've got a couple building maintenance things we're going to be working on here in the next couple of weeks. The front big fancy wooden door that we put on the water plant needs repainted and pressure washed and fixed. That's going to take a little bit to do it right. It's got to be sealed. That wooden door they put on there just expands and contracts, and there's so many cuts and holes in it. It's, it's, it's everything's got to be resealed and glued because it's leaking like crazy. So we'll get that done before the winter. We're going to replace the carport over here on the fire station. I know it's old and. We're going to try to keep it to a minimum, but it's it's uh, the wind catches it, it's flopping up. That we need it to protect our uh, our piece of equipment. So, so. Back here. Yes, correct. Right here, the little cardboard. That's what you put on our back to the trailer. You try to keep it out of the rain. And, uh, it needs replaced. But, uh, as far as that goes, that's pretty much all I got right now. Is there? You guys got any questions for me or anything that? <clears throat> You want to know or don't want to know? Or... I would just say thank you for all you're doing. And you're I would highly recommend that we buy some extra water. Plant. <laughs> <laughs> like, we should have it in our <clears throat> resiliency stuff. We do. We do. I have, I, I have everything that I need. For basic emergencies that I can take care of, we have I have fittings and parts for, and I keep two of everything. Yeah. And, when, and when something breaks in the water plant, I order two of them. So I, it's it's done me well. I mean, I don't I don't want to not have what we need to fix it. I hate to say I can't do it. I don't have a part. I hate that. So, <laughs> and a lot of other cities come to us when they have emergencies, and Katie get they get this part, or you know, and, and we. We've done that before. It's kind of uh, we've had to contact other cities. We we work pretty well together like that too. If there was a big emergency, what would you have us say to people who complain about the smell in the water? Uh, there's really nothing I can do about it. So I am bound by law in the state to do certain things to that water, and I'm not going to change it because I'm legally liable. So it, it's a smell that uh, you know it's a chlorine mixing you know with the with the water we have in the makeup of the water and people were so used to the same exact water for so long it's not the same water as it's, it's it's just not the same and and there's nothing and right now it's even different because I'm mixing the two waters right so it's it's been a 
It's been, you know, I don't want them to be not happy with their water years because so, I take my job serious and it, 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 it upsets me. I, I, I work hard at doing what I can. And, um, it's, uh, that's a tough situation, a tough one to answer. So I, I guess you're, you're not going to make everybody happy. So I mean, 95% of the comments I get are good. Yeah. So yeah. I can say that completely. And it's a few. And sometimes, it, you know, and that's why I say I, I, I try to get rid of some of these dead end lines and stuff around town because we've got a few over on H Street that were at dead ends. Um, yeah, your house is on a dead end line over there. It's a small two inch. I've always wanted to fix that. And it's just getting the time and, and what we need to do. And every year I try to pick up a couple of them because the circulation of the system. Is, is what makes it healthy. So, because especially in the winter, if there's not a lot of people here, you got nobody on the street using water but one person, they're going to get the water that's been sitting in the, in the water. Box. So, there's more to it than just the smell. And there's a lot that goes into it. So, um, the circulation is a big thing. I hate that in water lanes, but it's what we had and it's what they put in. So, I try to. Moving forward, when we put new stuff in, I, I don't, we try not to allow it, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a comment to add a little bit, and I've worked with almost every public works and department in the county on work excavation and stuff, and the comment you said at the beginning about your crews and stuff, Mark's crews is, is the best that I've worked with. And stuff and people well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, there's when I was excavating, we wait hours sometimes on jobs. I just say, don't be afraid to come and you know ask for what you need. Yeah, okay. don't like you know, don't sit on it because we want to provide sure. the best that we can for all of our residents. And just budgetary wise, the upgrades in the computer system have been budgeted. Mark and I worked on that, and so that they are in this year's budget. All right, so it's something that you shouldn't need to come to you uh, for reserves. I, I may have to come to you on the water conservation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much that's going to cost. It's not something that was budgeted, it's something that was brought up on me, but it was unforeseen. So I have no idea what that's going to cost. I should know within the next two days. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, then. Okay. Yeah, no. okay. Thank you. Have a good night. See you also. Um, well, fire chief, you're missing your. I just said my drill over there. Interim fire chief. They got a good crew over there. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Mr. Sweet. I did get uh, my report for tonight. Hopefully you guys all have the monthly report. I think you did. In that, um, you'll see that we had 49 calls last month. Um, in that, for the auto mutual aid calls to help you know, other departments in the county, we went to Seaside seven times, Kennedy Beach once, Warrington once, and Hamlet twice. And that's counted in that 49 calls. Uh, right now, we are 111 calls ahead of last year. Um, at this time, and so we have 335 calls currently with that. Uh, looking ahead for the summer, as a county, we typically hold off as county-wide training. We have uh, trainings that we do, all the departments get together and train. We hold off on that in the summer because of all the extra workload and uh, stuff that the summer brings along, but it allows our training to be more focused to start more specifically further out. Wednesday, since it's lighter, longer, and nicer, we'll be outside more. Um, and it's safe for the training, so we focus on wildland fires, uh, water rescues, and road rescues is what our main focus is today. Along with um, our continuing education with uh, the practical training plans that prepares our fire packs for the all hazard response uh, that we do now. Um, a little bit of data for the district that we cover. Uh, here, our fire covers 39 square miles of coverage. We currently have 25 volunteers and operate out of two stations. Model of it is just like Warrington Fire Department, and they have a Hammond station um, because they're spread out just like we are. So when we get a call on my firefighters that let out cold direct surf lines, they will go to the herd station and get apparatus. 
And then they'll meet up on scene with apparatus and stuff in the main station, which makes calls happen much faster, which gets people and resources to the incidents much, much quicker when emergencies happen. Uh, the apparatus that's out there is either a hand down that was here, the engine that's out there, like was a hand down from here. Um, uh, the tender, and uh, uh, I believe, was purchased by the Dero district. And then the uh, mini farm that was there was off of a grant that was purchased. So it's not any like specific city resources that there to the hand down or specific stuff that's out there. Um, so the station out there it works really, really well. Uh, the responders respond to my homes so today. Um, get the apparatus and I'll tell you, and then all the way up to here is all over here. But it'll get resources here much quicker than if we had to rely on them all the way past the scene or come through the accident to get over to here and get stuff. Where the, um, talking to our volunteers, I want to make a, a quick uh, comment that there's only one thing that separates the DR volunteers and big city crew firefighters, such as like Portland Fire, that's the only thing that separates them is how much they get paid. Uh, they have the exact same certification, they go through the exact same training. Everything that they do is, is the exact same firefighter, just not paid to do it. Um, so they do a fantastic job of helping us out with that. And I know there's been some comments and thoughts of full time staffing, what it would take. And just to staff one engine, so if our engine goes to a fire just for three people on one engine, to staff that all the time, it takes 10 people because it's three people on crews, 24 hours on, 40 hours off. And so then that makes nine. So you have one person for vacation, sick time, and stuff. And that costs about a million dollars a year just for one crew to stop an engine uh, with that. So not only the volunteers um, save um, the city lots and lots of money, they also, my next thought is, is uh, our department, the city and the district, has an ISO class three or C rating, depending on which insurance form you're filling out, someone a letter, someone a number. Uh, that scale on a one to 10, one being the best, 10 being the worst. Us being a class three saves homeowners and businesses lots and lots of money on their homeowners insurance. And that's because of the volunteers we have, because of their training, because of the equipment we have, and everything we have that goes into that. Uh, is able to save lots and lots of money uh, for all the taxpayers on the homeowners for that. Uh, quick notes of our current station. It's the oldest in the county. Uh, we have zero room for training. We have to park apparatus outside. I have to keep more expensive apparatus inside. We don't have any decontamination areas in there. Uh, the air mask that we wear so we can breathe inside a fire, we have to clean them in our kitchen sink that our crew is prepared with and everything. So all the contaminations and the carcinogens that's, that we come in contact with on fires gets on our mask and we have to clean them in the sink. <laughs> We're um, preparing uh, everything else, washing dishes and cleaning food and everything. Yeah. Um, there's just no room at all in the station. At all. Our, uh, all of our, our gear that we wear in, uh, in the fires and stuff, it gets exhaust and it gets carcinogens from the exhaust from all the diesel rigs um, every time we back in or, or leave with an apparatus. Our air station that we fill air with so we can breathe clean air inside the fire gets all the exhaust fumes from other apparatus that pulls in back. So just the same as right here. There you go. Um, so there's lots of other notes, and I'll give this report to you guys later, trying to keep my time short. With that, so as uh, our station, we have we have far exceeded its capacity and, and gotten the well used out of it. For being the oldest station in the county, I think we've done a, a good job of keeping that going the best we can. Uh, July 4th, we just came out. Uh, we had 25 calls for service on July 4th this year. Um, two of them were during the parade, but I know Mr. Sleep a little bit, a little bit on um, thoughts about the parade and such. Uh, they were not caused by the parade, they just happened at the same time. So, my center's so going on there. Um, I had an apparatus out on what we call tactical patrol. They're out in the area in the neighborhood, whether they're on the beach or a dune trail or driving in the neighborhoods. Because they're out doing that, we mitigate a lot of issues. We didn't have any fires in the dunes here in our district. Uh, we had to push some people out of the dunes that were hanging out in there when people were starting fires in the dunes or too close to the beach grass. We were able to tell them we need to move that way and different things. So we mitigated a lot of issues just from the staffing and the crews we had here during the day. Yeah, we had 25 calls for that day. And because we were here, a seaside did end up having a call, a brush fire. Um, it was a call in between. This vet said, I'm getting calls from Avenue I, Avenue J. I'm getting... <laughs> so all these people are calling in. It was called in a, a 10 by 10 fire. At the end result, I believe I was told it was a 20 by 20. And one of the firefighters on scene from Seaside said it was kicking their butts before our crew got there. They were able to put out and stuff. So because I believe a crew's here, we were ready to go. We were able to hit there. Go over, get it done really quick, and come back and come back and service here. There wasn't a big delayed response because they all come up in the house and stuff. So we had volunteers here all day long. We left here at 1 30 in the morning 
We were here um, about 8 a.m. setting up for the parade, and then we left about 1 in the morning. We had a little campfire on the apron, a little campfire pit hanging out, kind of family atmosphere and stuff, and doing great over there, um, bringing people in. We had law enforcement come, and a sheriff that we stopped in a little bit. I know Chief Bowen got lunch and dinner from us over there. He said, you know, you're got food for you and helped him out. So uh, July 4th was very successful, I think, for us. And we were able to uh, mitigate a lot of stuff just by uh, what we put in place for that. Uh, one last note I wanted to go over. I saw in the correspondence section, there's emails that somebody sent in. Uh, one from Neil Grubb. He brought up uh, specific incidents um, for a fire living on Pine Ridge. I talked about this in my May report uh, months ago, if you guys remember a little bit of that. Um, I had three of my firefighters and a staff vehicle show up uh, on scene before any um, fire apparatus. I'm talking like our fire engines next door, the last one, the C7 happened. So they got there and started setting up the command post, and the other two firefighters started getting ready to meet the incoming apparatus. And then we were coming down the road, and we actually, when we saw Seaside's, we were coming down here our loop, and Seaside's ladder truck was coming up here our loop. We slowed down to let Seaside's ladder truck in because that's for protocol. That ginormous ladder truck, which is, I'm very glad Seaside has it and we get to use it whenever we need it. We don't have to pay for it. The protocol is, is that that has to get parked first because it's so big. So we'll let that come in first if we can all help if possible. Now, if we're going in there first and we're there in line, we're not going to stop and wait for it. We still go in, but we just have to be careful where we stay, where we park, to let them come in and make room for them. We saw them coming up the road, so we slowed down and let them come in. We came in right behind them, uh, which worked very, very well. And we were able to keep that fire. We just had one. The fire damage was just to the one residence. There's water and smoke damage that went um, through the apartment complex a little bit. But that worked really, really well. Um, the email stated, he guesses Seaside shows up first to our emergencies. And since I've been here, I can remember two times uh, that that happened. Once was a car accident that happened in front of our substation um, out on the highway. Uh, the seaside staff dealer that was driving on the highway witnessed it right in front of them. So naturally, they would be there before us. Uh, they asked his best to tone us out. And once we had a handle on the situation, seaside staff vehicle continued on their way and we took down a car crash. The other time seaside covered us, um, while they were first to the call was when they were covering us while we were at our annual banquet when one of our firefighters were getting ready to cover them. So they would go to a scene before we got there. Naturally. Um, the email goes on to say he thinks the combined emergency response uh, with Seaside makes sense. There have been conversations with Seaside Chief as well as the Seaside City Manager. They both said it would take an increase of a million dollars per year in their budget to merge. Um, also, you as a city would be handing over all of your equipment to the new district because it would be forming the fire district. You'd be letting go of all the resources you have. Additionally, here are the seats that already function as one team. Everything I discussed in my May report, I went over talking about it takes 25 firefighters and about five apparatus to handle this in the structure fire. Um, it's just too taxing on one part. And I did say before we have 25 volunteers, but we may get three to respond, two to respond. So call them up, call them up to respond with volunteers. They have jobs and homes and life, stuff they had to deal with. So when a call comes in that will tax the department, we have mutually an automatic aid agreement with every department in our county, even outside of our county. We've gone down to an Halem four years ago and they had a trailer touchdown because they helped us maybe five years ago. Um, we've had um, departments come here when we needed help um, for many other calls and stuff. So um, we work very, very well with that. Um, and uh, we continue to hope to do that. If you guys have any other questions or anything for me? I'll send this out. You guys will get it in, in detail. We'll go from there. Sales have like awesome. We're from the 4th of July. We yeah, we did good. The crew, the crew was excited. They did good work. We were even down apparatus because one one down climb a call. It's helping them uh, with the lightning move up because they were pretty worried about their lightning and stuff. So we were down apparatus and three personnel. We still were able to, to pull out what we pulled out. So there's a great group of people next door. Over there. Without them, it wouldn't happen. I'm there. Yeah. I can just say too, I've done a lot of work uh, with fire departments, particularly around volunteer issues. This Chad found out a couple years ago when he Googled it. Um, and that rating for a primarily volunteer fire department is just amazing. It really yeah. is. You just, I mean, that's their their non-volunteer all career fire departments that don't don't hit that rating. So that yeah, um, 
all praise to uh, our interim chief and the volunteers. That that's really good, and it saves people a lot of money. It does. It does, and it's not just we have to approve it. We have to test it. About four years ago, we had to prove that we could do it. We had a um, we parked out of the school and we drove up. We had to drop a quarter tank and we had to fill the quarter tank and we had to draft out of it all within like two minutes. And we did. We beat the score we beat, we've had before. And so it's the it's our volunteers. It's their training, their certifications. It's the apparatus and equipment we have. It's it's the entire big package. Like, like uh, Trina just said, it's some crew departments can't handle that. And we've done good. Yeah, we have a great crew. Thank you for your service. Of course, wouldn't do anything else. And just for perspective, uh, our entire budget for the fire department is five hundred sixty-six thousand uh, for the year. But take note that two hundred seventeen thousand of that comes from the district. So they're actually paying, you know, uh, yeah. almost half. The, half the <clears throat> so I'm getting pretty good value out of this group. Yeah. Thank you. And you guys will have this as soon as Christy sends it out for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the, the chief of police uh, is floating around here, but we have this in the packet. And um, city treasurer. I just have a couple things, so I don't want to waste too much of your time, but we did finally get our audit on, on Friday, July 2nd. Uh, acuity, it was uh, the worst case scenario to get it by Friday, but, but they pulled it off. They were on vacation this week, so they wanted to have it in for us as we try to get our refinancing done. So they had sent it to the state, so it's registered with the state. Uh, the city of Gerhardt has sent a check because it, there's a filing fee, so hopefully we have met all of those requirements. You guys will get an actual audit and a management report letter where they have their findings, best practices, those types of things. Um, and we'll send that out. They're mailing it to us, but they're gone this week. So we will make sure that all of you get that. Uh, they're also coming down and meeting with me, um, I think on July 22nd with a one-on-one -on -one for best practices. They just just so they can see what we do, what processes we have, and they can work with me to um, just kind of refine some of the things that we do. Uh, we are working with the bond refinance. Um, thank goodness the audit is done um, so that we can finally just plug in the last column of numbers, get that processed. Uh, Chad and I have a due diligence meeting on Monday the 12th. Uh, then they'll do a bond rating call and um, send it out for people to look at it and um, hopefully get some good uh, investment options for us. And then Bond Council will look at it and in early August, and then hopefully by August 23rd, it'll all be done. So um, another month of just a few little details. Uh, our current financials, so the June report that's in your book, um, in your packet from July 1 to June 30, uh, we implemented and approved the budget transfers, so, so they're in there. Um, in the budget last year, you approved transfers, and I there was 60000 from the general fund that went to police, care, fire apparatus, hazard mitigation, and building, and they're in the revenue section, so we made those and they're in the budget. And then we did a total of 120,000 from the water fund uh, to the water reserve fund and to the public works equipment. So those were already things that you guys had approved last budget cycle. We wait until we see if we have you know, adequate funds, how the budget is looking, and then Chad decides in June of whether or not we should um, implement those because they've been approved and you don't have to do it if they're not enough money. So, so they're in there. Uh, we also implemented the general fund category appropriation transfers that we did in resolution 962. So those have been put in there and, and all the funds, some of them by $8 are speaking by. Uh, account uh, number 10065, which is the fire equipment and manpower revenue, it increased substantially since the May report. And that was due to a transfer. I transferred um, for incorrectly coded fire reimbursement from the state that had been put into hazardous mitigation fund. 
Um, so I was looking through, looking through, saw the check was deposited. So we moved that. Uh, and then we did receive another reimbursement check in June. So that has quite a bit more money than it did in May. And I am starting the process of pulling time cards, looking at revenues and expenses, and sorting out all of that fire um, reimbursement funds. Account 101496 operating contingencies. Uh, it had expenditures in it, and I've transferred those out of there. There should have been expenditures in there. There were appropriate accounts that they should have gone in. So I transferred them to modular rentals in the building department because we actually have a modular building out there that we have to rent. And it shouldn't have been put in contingency. We had it for many years. And, and so I just put it in that fund. And then I created a 10 1499 under non departmental for CARES that shows the CARES Act money expenditures that was primarily the payments out to small businesses. So I made those transfers in the month of June. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to comment, July 1, new fiscal year, uh, PERS, uh, our public employment retirement system, every even year in the fall, uh, PERS board approves employer rates and um, for the upcoming biennium, so for their for a two-year cycle. And so rates did go up July 1, anticipated. We, we knew that, but I'm just letting you know. And it's effective through June 30th, 2023. But the employer rates didn't increase. So the city of Gerhardt is uh, the employee has to pay 6% pre-tax towards the retirement. And then the um, city pays, depending upon which category you're in, um, a percentage also of your gross salary towards your retirement. So the employer rates for tier one, tier two uh, went from 19.22% to 20.54%. Uh, for officer general service, they went from 9.43% to 12.91%. And for officer police and fire, it went from 14.06% to 17.27%. Uh, the city of Bearcar currently has three tier one, tier two members, uh, five officer general service members, and three police and fire members. So just little things changing every day. Sign the point. Thank you. I think I have a little bit more information on that. Last year, we budgeted three hundred and twenty thousand dollars for cash carry forward, but we only realized two hundred seventy three. You know, when we do our budget, it's it's kind of a guess because we still have the rest of the year to go through. Uh, but we were able to make it through this year pretty well. Uh, this year, you no, know, I am sky. It was a good estimation, if you will. I anticipated three hundred eighty thousand coming back into our general fund as a cash carry forward from last year. And we're still waiting for some of the dust to settle, but we're pretty pretty close to having four hundred twenty six thousand dollars cash carry forward. So this will be one of the best years for uh, cash carry forward and expenses versus uh, income uh, for the city of Gearhart. And I think, well, I can't say for sure, but at least in the ten years that I've been here, and uh, very likely before that. You're talking about the year just finished. The year that we just finished gave uh, the city of Gearhart four hundred twenty-six thousand in cash uh, to start our fiscal this year, which is great. Our goal was about five hundred thousand. Um, we'll see how it goes. Well, you want to get expensive, not buying a lot of pipes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll follow. We'll follow. Oh. Okay, so um, so you Sure. So we actually have a trial date for the U.S. Bank uh, Shan Smith case, and that's going to be happening in early December. Should be very interesting. Um, I would hope that maybe there would be a resolution to that short of trial, because there's no shortage of novel legal issues associated with that. Um, but you know, fingers crossed. I, I would like to um, just address one item of correspondence that we got. And that is the, um, that's the letter we received from Mr. Mori uh, regarding uh, a recommended plan. I think there's a map 
closed uh, showing parcels one, two, and three. And, and this is related to the, um, the UGB slash land swap. Uh, the rule regarding exactions is uh, there are two tests for um, United States Supreme Court test, one called Nolan, which is there needs to be a nexus between what you're asking for. And um, the second, uh, which is called Dolan, um, which is that the benefit that the city receives needs to be roughly proportionate to the benefit that the property um, owner receives. And so I think that there, there are a couple of concerns, three primarily um, I would have with the alternatives put out there. I think it makes sense to put those out there now. Um, one is that that's a lot of land uh, if you look at parcels one, two, and three. The second is that in all of our discussions with DL CD staff, we've been focusing on more the parcel two and, and the land that is east of that. And, and the reason that has been our area of focus with them is because as we look at tsunami resilience, one of the most critically important items is the elevation. And so the difference between 58 feet versus 32 to 35, as far as DLCD staff, um, and our ability to hopefully get some resiliency grants and stuff like that, those are available. That is a, that's a fairly substantial difference. We're talking about, about, a, about a, um, not quite a third, but, but over 25% higher in elevation. And then, you know, anything that we would do, this is not technically an exaction in that it's a broker negotiation with the property owner, but we would need for that to make sense um, for them. And I guess my concern would be if we are taking that many lots, then maybe they're ending up with around the same number, but smaller lots than they were before. And that point, I don't know that it would really make sense for them any longer. Um, we have, I have had discussions with their planner. They have agreed to give us full access to the highway as well as access to, is it Island? Island yeah. yeah, so we're going to be getting both um, north access um, as well as east access. Uh, we are not going to be looking for south access because that will be punching through our park and as well as, as the adjacent neighborhood. And, and you know, that's would disrupt the park if we had an emergency vehicle type of um, access there. Plus, I, I think the consensus is if we're headed in that direction, getting onto the highway uh, makes more sense anyway. They've agreed to um, that access, that road access that we would need there. So, you know, as we, as we look at various options and kind of the benefits and the burden, burdens of the, the different sites, that's something that I just wanted to put on the table so you could understand why, you know, some of the reasons why we were looking at the particular parcel for the fire station that we were, that's really related to elevation. And then the other thing that I would say, because again, tonight we heard about there, at least perception being that there, is a lack of billable lots in the city of Gerhardt. And so to Portland State or other entities calculate that, one of the things that they look back at is the 10 year growth. And so if you look at like a, a 2017 or 2018, the 10 years that were drawn into that were like 2007 through 2017. And the problem with those numbers is that you had, depending on the community, five or perhaps six years where there just wasn't a lot of building going on at all. Um, and so then coupled with what, what seems to be kind of low-end population projections, that's how you end up with them saying, well, you need 70 houses over the next 50 years when we know we've done, I think, more than 70 single-family permits in the last 24 months. So it it's, it may seem counterintuitive, but if we want to have more options as far as, and we're constricted as far as where we could move, move our UGB. So what we're really talking about would be a rezone, either of commercial property or of industrial or, or what have you. The, the more lots they get developed prior to that global lands inventory housing needs analysis, the more flexibility we as a community would have 
to do a rezone. So if it's whether it's something, and I'm just throwing stuff out, whether it's something like the school site being rezoned is more of a, of a workforce housing type of thing, or whether it is other, you know, non-city owned, non park land, because that's off the table, but whether it might be an industrial or commercial that perhaps is underutilized, we might, might make more sense for a higher density apartment. Our ability to do that is really premised on housing being built now, so we can point to that, that um, lack of inventory. And so I just put that out there as well. That does seem counterintuitive, but that is how our system works. Any other questions for Peter Flynn? So the Highlands Lane access will be in the written agreement. Yeah, they they have agreed to bolt it in order. And in fact, they they thought that was a very good idea. Um, but they've agreed to bolt that access as well as the eastern access. Um, both of those will be um, required terms in the written agreement. Great, Peter. I got a question. Um, it's on the comprehensive plan. Yeah. Um, the DLCD, the LCDC goal 16 is for the uh, estuary. Is this something we were mandated to follow these, these rules in this? So when you're looking at the various um, uh, rules, other than I'm going to set aside rule one, which is public participation, um, I'll put that in a different category. But if you're looking at balancing the other rules, it's just that. So one of the things that we were talking about, well, before we were talking about the land swell for the parcel where the fire station might end up is, can we serve them with water? And so there are health and safety reasons why for redundancy purposes, and I'm glad that our public works director got into that a little bit earlier. We want redundancy in our system, so it makes sense to, if they were outside of our EGB and they were under the county zone, that we would want to supply them with water because it helps loop our system. On the other hand, we have um, a comprehensive plan saying that we we won't, um, unless they're health and safety reasons, we won't supply water out extraterritorially. So those are at odds, and so they require a balancing. And, and we were actually having that conversation with our planner. Um, it implicated three different elements of call plans slash goals. Uh, and then this opportunity presented itself. And then we realized, well, if they're inside our urban growth manager, it's no longer extraterritorial water. So as far as anything like such as the estuary, anything else, um, those we weigh all of those goals. Uh, we also have goal 10, which requires cities to provide a variety of housing options. So work for so the the idea of line is getting harder and harder to comply with that, but the idea is a variety of housing for a variety of income levels, um, which is tough for us because we're on septic systems and we got minimum lot sizes and, and other things. But it's a matter of balancing all those goals against each other. And in the elements of our call plan, like we want to we want to buy it downtown, but we also don't want to attract tourists. So we you know we have to balance those. And so it's just, um, it's all about weighing the, um, weighing one benefit versus another. And why do you put uh, goal one and two, the citizen involvement off to another category? Because the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court have consistently said that that is the most important goal. So the most important goal is that people have uh, meaningful ability for public participation in the system and they have originally all the goals were supposed to be used equally uh, and they've set that goal apart and said no this is the most important goal which is is meaningful public participation okay yes thank you man uh, can i again just take back, back again one of the issues with the Access from the fire station east to uh, the highway. Uh, some of the concerns was whether or not it was possible and whether or not Oregon Department of Transportation will allow such a thing. I met with uh, Ken Schumpfather with Oregon Department of Transportation. 
and he's providing a report and uh, what their understanding of that access would mean to them, filtered through transportation systems plans and all that. And so, uh, you know, initial estimations is it's possible. Uh, and as well as an engineer who looked at the wetland uh, area and through that and how we would make crossings through there. Uh, and then, uh, he also, in his initial estimations, thought it was possible. And this, this gentleman had experience doing uh, multiples of those and uh, some other in this area. So we're doing some more work with that. And we'll, we'll get some more data uh, to the council as that comes in for our report. Were there room hang up hold ups or anything with the um the road being built into Shamrock? Do we know the history on that? Yeah, uh that's one of the things that they're looking into. I don't know exactly how that was, but yeah, what we did find out is of course that road was put in prior to being in the city of Gerhart. It was done through the county uh somewhere about 15 years ago. And so uh, they're gonna look at that as an example. But yeah, that is a good example of crossing on those uh, those roadways, and they did enhance it. We're you know, using an oversized culvert for that area also. And uh, I know some of the roads that are currently crossing uh, those locations near where we would like to probably aren't um, as robust or as flow uh, free flowing as, as they should be. But I think uh, you know, ours would be built in a way to the best suit the environment. And then potentially we can do some things to upgrade the adjacent uh, water crossings also. So all ideas that we're working with. Challenge report. Okay, I'll just go by a few things. If I do this right, everybody else will make the report for me moving forward. <laughs> but I do have a few things that I'd like to update you on. The uh, building report that uh, was promised here, I did not get the data that I wanted for that. So that is going to be forthcoming here, hopefully by the end of this week to the city council. So I don't have a solid report on that. Uh, code enforcement, you know, we had a few noxious vegetation complaints, so we're taking care of those. Uh, the people are responding and they're uh, going ahead and taking care of those overgrown weeds and, and things such as that. And we also had a couple of beach vehicle complaints, you know, on the little beach and one incident we had a couple of vehicles you know, somewhere in the night, went all the way in the little beach, set up a camp and then proceeded to lose their car keys. Uh, so it took us a little while longer to get them off of the beach. Uh, Jeff Bowen helped out the Sons of Beaches group, ultimately was able to figure out how to get into those vehicles and get them started. Uh, and then we were able to lose them all. Uh, those people were apologetic, but they just didn't see the signs. And they all left. Um, see finance, we took care of public works, uh, staff administration, of course, the employee handbook is officially in force, so that's working well. Uh, fire chief position update, uh, you have user plan at the end of the month. Uh, we have reached out to a few of the qualified candidates and asked them for more letters of recommendation so we can uh, bring those to you and uh, the interview panel as that develops. Uh, let's see, your vacation rental tax amendments is due on July 15th, so that should be coming in. Uh, two parking complaints in June, we took for vacation rentals, but it really wasn't a big deal. We just had people lose cars so they didn't want to do from neighbors and such. Um, and there is a flyer in correspondence having to do with the short term rental moratorium. And I was approached, uh, let's see, by Gail Henderson of uh, Classic County. Just to make you aware of the short term rental conversation that they had, but the short story is the county is looking at a moratorium for unincorporated areas for about six months on any new short term vacation rental permits. Now, there are about 200 rental permits or so in the county outside of the incorporated area, and actually, most of those are in the Arch Cape uh, area and through there. Uh, the, the commission uh, for the county is really looking at two separate ordinances, one that is specifically for Archgate, and then one that would be an overlay for um, the rest of the county. Now, I'm not sure on the particulars and what they're working with, but this moratorium is for them to hold back before making other, any other decisions and do some more research. So they wanted to know from the council standpoint, 
if you had any objection to the six month moratorium. This does affect land that is in the Gearhart urban growth boundary. For example, that is the Palisades and the Highlands neighborhood. But we don't control the short term location rules. If you remember, we gave them the opportunity to decline. And you cannot receive any tax revenue from them based on the fact that they're not in the incorporated uh, gear market. So, what is the ramifications of a six month moratorium for us? I'm not sure, but she wanted to give you the opportunity to comment. So, if you have any comments about that, you can either tell me now or take some time and uh, send them in to me as we learn more. There will be some articles coming out of the uh, story and here as progresses. I don't have a problem with the word target. I don't see that even if we had a problem that it would be our business to influence the decision. So the county is in the driver's seat for those guys. So let them do what they want to do. I'm on the one. Well, I don't think I'm it's okay. All right, I'll pass that on to uh, Governor. Uh, Citizen Advisory Committee, we have parts updates. Um, you know, there is a draft revision of the work for that. Uh, small business update, we have grants, of course, and we have some made some calls to some uh, survey takers uh, that requested one. There's 10 of them. So we'll have a report uh, based on that. But they were pleased to hear. Uh, these were people that wanted a response from the committee uh, or staff as to what some of the outcomes or the next steps were going to be. So there were things that we were communicating to them and uh, they will wait to see how this progresses. There were a few comments that we posted. Emergency cash program spent a few hours up on the cash site with the uh, three of the uh, firefighters and uh, Christy and I, and we organized the cash system and did the inventory on them and everything is okay really good. Also make sure that they were secure. Uh, the corridor project, uh, there's an update here, and we're gonna have some upcoming meetings here soon. The next step is for there actually the site visit with the group. We're gonna meet here, uh, I believe, at the end of it's Monday. Yeah, next Monday. Uh, and we're gonna talk about you know some of the things that looks at uh, like so that's coming up. Uh, Ridge Path construction resumed. It is resuming this week. We're installing some of the, uh, uh, the columns for the railway. We've got all the material delivered for that. And then still next Tuesday and Thursday, we're planning on uh, installing some of the decking. And that will be a uh, volunteer effort as well. And we have a uh, volunteer champion, Steve Ehrman, that's helping to organize that for us. Uh, and have a meeting tomorrow with the Elk Collaborative. We're going to be reviewing draft, uh, draft declaration of cooperation and review budgetary needs for the community. Uh, playground equipment, we met with fuel recreation, and just today we received three different plans and some uh, uh, things that may work for Gerhardt. So I'll meet with the mayor as we've been kind of heading that up and uh, talk them over and see what we get next with that. But we did finally receive those. And again, the total funds raised was almost thirty-one thousand dollars, twelve thousand two hundred raised by Berkeley. Uh, fire station update: We have a survey on the website blog and is mailed to every active water billing account. Uh, we had a close to oh, I have the number in here. I think about one hundred and sixty or so responses so far. Uh, nothing to report because I don't really want to steer anybody at this point. Um, but uh, things are starting to come in, and we're going to continue to keep it first and foremost through August 1st. Uh, we are updating the FAQ page, which is some of the questions that are coming up for the city. And we did do the geotech study last Monday, uh, excuse me, Monday before last. And uh, they were able to drill down farther than they anticipated. And so we're going to get a lot of good data about the aquifer and uh, the makeup of the dune. And so they're working on the report now that should be presented here. I think we might end this next week. Grants, uh, you know, things are kind of moving along there. Uh, on the radar, we have our work session. 
Uh, from Tuesday the 29th, Council Goals, Homelessness, Parking, Construction Noise. I think that went really well the conversation. Next, we have Tuesday, July 27th. That's going to be a joint board session with the Planning Commission and the Small Business Committee. Oh, small Business Committee and the City Council Planning Commission. Um, and other than that, I just had a few comments about some of the uh, correspondence also that we're looking at. Uh, I provided a story, I think it's page two in the correspondence, that I think was used uh, during a uh, complaint by the Secretary by Jack Zimmerman. This was a story that a county news focused on disaster preparedness by Nicole Bales and the historian of May 12, 2021. Um, the complaint you know, got, uh, talking about the fact that I had said when he was talking about our site for the fire department, then I said that if, if they did report that this was a, a dangerous area in regards to subduction, that it was made an error. And it's not entirely true that it wasn't an error, but it, the article that they were referring to is definitely not site specific. So the Nicole Bales with the historian talked to uh, a couple of people here, Gail Hendrickson and Ryan Barton with Parametrics. I called both of them to discuss their quotes in this location. And what both of them said is that this article is referring to this area at a very high level kind of uh, look at things. As a community of Gearhart into Warrington and really in the seaside and to the east side of the town, it is true that this area is susceptible to the fact, and that is a fact. But what they didn't do is inform on site-specific locations, such as the area that we're looking at now or High Point that we looked at just previously. Um, so because they didn't address those types of locations, somebody could infer that, yes, this whole area is, is going to be subject to some uh, liquefaction. So th this will help inform us. Uh, the entire region seaside, Beer Park, Warrington, uh, parts of uh, north of Beer Park are included. And so I, I kind of did a little bit of research just again to make sure that we were heading in the right direction. Now, the geotech reports one of the for this. This is going to tell us a lot of information about this too. And keep in mind also that uh, Jellis uh, Tom Horn, uh, he has said that the dune that's in front, where we're looking at uh, High Point, is about 2,000 years younger than this dune that we're looking at. So this is a, an older dune, a more stable dune. It's a larger dune in the, in the location that we're looking at, 400 and some feet wide and 68 feet uh, in elevation, which is higher than what High Point was uh, already. And so liquefaction uh, is, you know, is a study of water saturated soils and sand. Right? And so I, I did some research on liquefaction and talked to some people. And really, I found the best definition from the Utah Geological Survey um, was the easiest to understand, but it said the same thing as the others. That uh, where liquefaction is likely to occur is, of course, sandy soils that are adjacent to or uh, uh, with water. And there's two conditions that must exist for liquefaction to occur. One is the soil must be susceptible to liquefaction. So loose, water-saturated, sandy soil, which we have a lot of throughout town. Some places are, are more susceptible than others because typically between zero and 30 feet uh, below the ground surface, uh, within that 30 foot range of the land up above, that's where you get kind of the most liquefaction. But land that's up and higher than that, such as 85 feet where we're at, is going to really see less liquefaction. And that's a conversation that I had with um, a gentleman uh, some time ago, and this was Dr. George Priest, who was with the Gong. Now, Dr. George Priest did uh, a publication here. Uh, this was starting in 04. It was a comparison of Oregon tsunami hazard scenarios, hazard analysis. And he's the one that really came up with the t shirt size 
uh, for tsunami hazard areas and zones and evacuation routes. And he, before he retired from the government, he worked with the city of Deerhart to place our evacuation sites. He was the one that allowed the evac or helped to allow the evacuation sites to be within the tsunami zone, uh, especially the XXL. And his reasoning of what he told me at that point is that the Deerhart dunes themselves, because of their distance from the aquifer, will actually perform quite well in a large earthquake with liquefaction because of their height, their distance from the actual water. Fun experiment you can run for yourself. Go down to the beach with your sand bucket. Grab some sand in the beach. Put them fill about halfway up in your bucket. And go ahead and put some salt water in there that's just below the surface of that sand. And shake it. And that will show you what liquefaction is. <clears throat> It's also very evident during the tide changes when you walk on the sand and it kind of wiggles. That's liquefaction. To run the experiment, so it's similar to what we would see in the dunes, to my way of thinking, is take that same sand bucket, keep the same amount of water in it, but pile some more sand on top of it, maybe double. Go ahead and shake that. The top sand, because of its distance from the water, does not settle like a something that was close to the aquifer. So this location, we're at about 27 feet from the aquifer, and you look at zero to 30, you know, that's where most typical liquefaction happens. If you look down at the school site, you know, you're looking at 17 feet on average, which is closer to the aquifer. The high point was a 62, and this one is a 68. It offers better uh, chances of surviving that sort of scenario. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen. And that's one of the reasons that we have to prepare for a more stable type of foundation. So the foundation is going to be expensive. And what this was do is when things shake and you take a pile of sand and shake it, you get what's called a lateral spread. The foundation type that we're looking at and what we've kind of crossed out on a basic level is uh, we prevent most of that. Not all, nothing's perfect. So by looking at the dunes, by having our uh, assembly areas in the dunes, by staying away from areas that are closer to the aquifer, um, these are the reasons that the city council and city staff are looking at these higher elevations and why they would work and why George Priest agrees with that type of scenario and thinks that our best chance is to be higher. So that article really didn't address that particular location, it addressed the, the, the larger part, and, and we do have answers. I've got lots of information on George and all the papers that he wrote um, and his executive summary and some of the awards that he's uh, been awarded throughout uh, the theology community. Uh, and he's currently a fellow at, uh, I can't remember the name of the college, but uh, over at the community space. So and that was kind of in reaction to some of Jack's um, uh, formal complaints that he had. And I just wanted to say that, yes, we are thinking about this constantly. This is a very important core part of our resiliency. Um, the only other comment, I think that everybody else to be here, the other correspondence that I wanted to talk about, that was Jack at failure notice. Um, ski trailer has been successfully uh, Put out there, we can see the accounts that we get from that. And I think that's all that I have for now. What's our, what's our speed record? Well, I don't know about this location. I'm imagining it's not going to be as good as some of the others because the roll up area is fairly short. So you really have to have a power car. But when we did have the 23,000 cars or so on um, Cottage during the last speed trailer deployment, uh, the average speed was again 24 point something average for all of those cars. But I believe the speed record on that one was 71. And that was done by one car. Then the next highest level was like 40 something to 50 something, I think. So most people. <clears throat> this topic keep going 15 to keep that average down. Right? <laughs> We're kind of skewing it down, though. I think you and John listen. <laughs>
If you go backwards, does it give you a negative number? <laughs> <laughs> it counts your speed going in. Remember, we count both directions. People don't know that when we do. Can I think I have a couple questions? No. Go ahead. I think we were starting that. Um, I just want to ask, have we talked to our insurance carrier liability about the playground equipment and the wood uh, premium differential impact our decision on which equipment we get? Um, I have talked to Phoenix Insurance about some of the liability with this. There will be a slight increase in our insurance. Uh, but as far as the certifications that these vendors that we're using, uh, they use uh, building methods and construction methods that are widely accepted in the industry as free of um, injury liability as possible. Um, there are some certifications, I'm not familiar with the exact acronym for them. But yeah, there will be a slight increase in insurance for something like this. But if your heart has a pretty good record of insurance, we've won multiple safety awards. Uh, our buildings, you know, are in good shape and we haven't had very many of them. So I anticipate that our ranking will not go up significantly as far as liability and cost. But no, I don't have an exact number for you yet. Okay. We just finally got three plans out there. So at this point, now we feel more comfortable submitting that to CIS and asking them to do a, uh, we do a hazard study with them every year. We talk about every aspect of your heart. Do you have bridges? Do you, you know, a lot of fireworks display shows that the city pays for? Do we have pools? Things like that. They, they, they rank us in that. And then they take everything that we say yes to and they help uh, mitigate that and adjust our insurance rates. So this is one of the marks. So this by equipment. That will have an increase. Yeah. I was trying to have headed off in the past before we make a decision that if one particular piece of equipment was going to raise our rates 25% and another almost as good piece of equipment was 10%, then maybe that would influence our decision on what we could park. What were you Probably what you put in the main it, it's, it's generally uh, very minimal unless it's something like a high diving board or a zip point. If we were to do hydro <laughs> or something of that nature, suddenly our, our insurance would spike. But if you think about all of the city, like one, one playground equipment, particularly new, because it's, it's actually the older playground equipment where they were less concerned about injuries that, that come with the higher premiums. And now I think people are very careful about kids. Oh, uh, excuse me. Christy uh, did some research on this and she found through Knudsen Insurance that there will be no increase in our insurance for this. I just got a note from them here. Uh, so we'll still check the CIS, but Knudsen does that. Great. I just had a, a comment that I believe to be a correct statement. You can, anybody can correct me if they disagree with this, but a geotechnical report once completed for this new property that we're looking at for the fire department would be the presiding document that would basically be the record of what we can and can't do, how dangerous it is, what we need to do to mitigate those dangers. And I believe that most every agency would defer to that as the correct data. Yeah. So people's speculation of whether it's a good spot, bad spot, or otherwise really doesn't mean a whole lot compared to what that document actually says. Correct. Correct. And Tom warning this it's going to be uh, in pretty good shape for what we want to do. And it will dictate exactly how we build foundations. Right roadways access. It does actually lay out, doesn't it, the type of foundation that is required? The foundation, the initial work that we did for High Point came up with a certain foundation type that we would use in that location. It's likely that's that same foundation design 
will work in any location that we choose. Whether or not how successful it is it depends on where we put it. But uh, so yeah, we we are using as much of the information that we've already collected in order to make use of that and not have to again buy the information or pay for somebody to study again. So I gave them all the information that we have so that they're utilizing that in their calculator. Any other questions or comments for Jeff? So we've kind of walked uh, through and around the correspondence and a lot of the reports we've just been hearing. Are there any other comments or questions with regard to correspondence? I would just throw out that when I get them and you'll see some of the correspondences addressed to myself, I I do try and write back. Sometimes I have to consult some of our employed experts, but then I do try and get back with my faith and an unofficial official response of some sort. Uh, so that they're not just sitting out there with no response at all. I, I'm curious, there's two pieces of correspondence relating to the idea of putting moratorium on fireworks in the community. Any? I'm curious what the council's thought is on that. I did post that question a couple months ago and I didn't get much response. Well, I understand the beach was a total mess, but we have no jurisdiction over the beach. Um, the people that I've talked to that went down there to clean it up said after spending three hours, they felt like they hardly made a dent. There was just trash everywhere. The fire is burning, you know, sand kicked over them, but the fire is still going. Glass everywhere. I don't know. That's a state park. I don't know if we can get the state to close the park. Yeah, I mean, the problem is technically it's the state highway. So if you if you look at how it's how it's classified, um, it is a state highway and our our jurisdiction is very limited. I, I think that given control, I think there are a lot of things, a lot of changes that we would make on it, but um, we would need to work through state agencies and ODOT in order to get this in place. Whether or not they'd be willing to do it, um, if they agreed to that sort of moratorium, and um, then, you know, we, our police have, um, then various police agencies can respond, but but it's the it's the state highway, so we would need for them to we would need for them to do it. So fireworks are not allowed on state highways, nor are they allowed on state parks. So are they? Why would there be yeah. an obstacle to? Maybe there's not. I think it would before we before we impose a ban. I think it would be good to check with that out. I'm sure. Well, and you're referring to the city, though. Right? I'm referring to the city. I mean, I, I'm talking about in the neighborhoods. I don't have a problem banning fireworks in the city. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I know talking to pet owners specifically, there's so many pets in our community that are so affected by fireworks. And it isn't just that it happens the 4th of July, it starts before 4th of July and carries on through. I mean, I hear, hear them oftentimes in, you know, Late July, early August, there's still sure. big things around here. We could definitely, that's within our purview. We could write, we can regulate um, them being discharged in the city as well as the sale of them in the city. I, I looked at that question for other jurisdictions. So within the city boundaries, we can. In talking with the police chief today, we talked about uh, if this was a really difficult fourth, and he said this was one of the easiest. Fourth of July is that he's ever had to deal with things because usually he said kids will go down to the end of 10th and party all down there. But this, he, this year, for some reason, they didn't want to walk through that long, you know, trail down there. And they all were north of 13th, which kind of puts them outside of our city limits. Is that right? Well, the jurisdiction of the beach is still a still the beach. But, but yeah. if you put them into more of a public eye, right? Uh, the Classic County Sheriff's Office did have a eye on this group. Yes. This particular group was a bad actor. They did do a lot of, uh, you know, they, there was a time where I was from 
the CCSO kind of saw that coming, made sure that they made some contacts, and after they left the mess, they brought some of these back. They cleaned up after it. And from the fire department side of things, this was uh, much quieter as far as uh, on the beach. For yes. Us. No fires so far, no fires in town. And uh, yeah, but the pets, you know, that, that is definitely a thing. Um, legal fireworks aren't as bad because they don't fly or explode. The illegal ones are definitely the ones that cause the most hurt. But even the days leading up to uh, Fourth of July, for various reasons, COVID, other things to do, people not coming to the beach. Um, for the most part, it, it was quieter than the year before, or the, the year before. Last year was horrible comparison. Um, and then Portland did go ahead and make fireworks illegal, I believe. Um, if it just comes down to the enforcement aspect of things, is, is a very interesting topic. And if you look at some of the helicopter reports that came through the news, Portland did in fact have quite the show, uh, but just it was too much and overwhelming for uh, the forces to be able to take care of. Um, but I'm not saying that we should give up. I'm not saying that we should think we should think about you know how to quell this in the future. But that's just the kind of my report what I was going to give about the parade also, which I can go through in a little bit. Yeah, that was our observations. Do we want to direct staff to draft an ordinance that we can consider? Yes. Can I'm do that? Yeah. Yes. I felt bad for people in Portland to have it sprung upon them 48 hours prior. That seemed a little inappropriate to me. We know they've already spent their money and such, but doing it this time of year for next year, I think is very appropriate. And I, I think as long as, and we, it could, if you guys decided this is where you want to go that, it could happen this fall. I think both for the vendors itself, fireworks, as well as people that might want to do them, that it makes a lot of sense to do it. I mean, look three to four months. If you look at the days they can actually sell fireworks in Oregon, I think it starts my recollection of the sessions it starts June 20th. So that would that would three months would give people plenty of notice that they that if they can buy them somewhere else, they can't just turn them here. Um well, and if they want to sell fireworks, they need to find some else so and lucky for us we don't have any vendors because it's not legal in here, right? So we would be affecting some of these purchasing fireworks now for next year. Um, except maybe Dollar General. I don't know if they sold any but that would be something. But the ones that are making all the noise, my sense would be they're from Washington. Uh, okay, anything else on correspondence then? I just wanted to say it was nice to get this one. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for giving grant money for focus. Uh, get a few more like that one. <laughs> that was a thank you card that we uh, had a photocopy of the board from this part. Okay, we're going to move on then to the visitors section. Do we have any comments? I don't have any emails, but to report to you, Mayor, that the battery has died since the beginning of the summer. We do have any visitors on the time right now. Okay, so nobody's emailed. Nobody's emailed. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go through, and if you want to speak, then uh, have your finger on your unmute button. So Tom is the first one. Change so Darcy. And the next one is John's iPhone. Mayor. Yes. I just wanted to let you 
Hi, I just wanted to let you know, John's iPhone has been trying to connect to audio the entire meeting. So I just wanted to point out that I do notice that. And if he can oh. hear me, he could try to call back in. <laughs> Oh, okay. I will come back to him. Uh, the next one is G7, think. Or thank you. Or thank you. Thank you. Next one is Bob Mori. No, thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you, Bob. And Dave Smith. Yes, he did leave some correspondence in addition to your desk. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. He's unmuted. Dave, if you, you've got the floor. Uh, we can't hear you if you're trying to speak. Uh, the next one is Lisa. Uh, no, thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, and the last one is area code 303. Okay, no visitor comments then. Um, ordinances and resolutions, we don't have anything there, but uh, uh, we would like to direct uh, the staff to work on uh, an ordinance, the appropriate ordinance, and I don't have the correct numbers, I don't want to misspeak. The ordinance having to do with uh, uh, contractors working specifically on the weekends, seems to be the biggest issue. It's noted in correspondence and we did talk about it at our work session. And if you could draft us something that had some sort of a reduction in hours for the weekends. Yeah, I'm imagining that would, I'm imagining that would look like maybe an option one day uh, for the weekend, we can clear work or two days, you know, we kind of like both ways see what that would look like um, and if there's any other ideas as far as restrictions go that you would like us to address please let us know your convenience and do our best to incorporate those i don't know the answer to this time those seem to be the two solutions that were most popular right and we just want to advertise that um, and make sure that the people are aware of that's up for consideration because um, that that's probably something that um, it's going to get some help with testimony. Right. So if we can get that on all our social media channels, it is, it's going to be a discussion item and we're going to be drafting a couple of different options for consideration. Okay. Um, and then moving on to old business, we have resolution 960 follow-up. And that was a report. And Report in the packet on the page with the work chart in the back. Um, sure, I'll touch upon this, um, Madam Mayor and Councilors. This was a, a valid question that was brought up by uh, Carrie Smith and uh, Councilor Smith and Councilor Fackrell. They were curious about the way that we were. Um, uh, using uh, the ordinance for the budget and whether or not the fire chief should or should not be included in the salary portion of this. So uh, long story short is we did a lot of research. Um, and by we, I mean mostly Christy. Uh, she did a lot of the research and she did a fine job on this. We learned a lot of things along the way, going to some of the old ordinances and things. Um, but this is having to do with the annual uh, salaries taking effect in the next uh, fiscal year. And the concern question was whether or not the fire chief was ever an official city officer. Um, we went through the charter, uh, of course, again, and we, you know, the charter is built on the organization, or the organizational charter on the back is built upon the charter uh, and how it was laid out. And then after Christy did a lengthy search through the resolutions back to 1970, 
Uh, we could not find any evidence amending the city charter to have our names by our chief, who's the GRC officer. We couldn't find any uh, evidence in past ordinances and or resolutions that had to do with this. And we, we just we would surmise that the, this happened for the first time in an ordinance in 2007 in regards to adding the fire chief in there, and that was under Dennis Canale at the time. But there was no identifiable reason, identifiable reason for that other than transparency is the, the best reason we can come up with. It also appears the fire chief title, uh, title began appearing in the council agenda or offers reports sporadically in 2010 through 11. And then after uh, I came in 2011 and 12 and after, it's just been in there monthly. Um, since the position is one, not one of the five officers to the staff, because it's justified in removing the salary. So far, unless otherwise, uh, right, I think a change in the charter of uh, we can list all the five officers going forward. Um, and then, as you know, also on this tonight's agenda, we have renamed the report section to encompass both city officers and leaders so that. Uh, updates from all the parts continue to be encouraged. So we did as much as we could. We also talked to uh, uh, Dennis McNally. Uh, he had no recollection of any change. And we also talked to uh, previous city administrator, Bruce Maltman. Uh, so some of the things that and he had no recollection of that either. So or was there any reason why um, that the fire chief would have been added? And especially because Bruce Maltman was also a fire chief back then. As well as some of jobs. So we did some research. That's what we found. Uh, it was educational for us as well. So if there's any questions. Uh, well, Madam Mayor, if I may, I would like to make a motion. And I would like to direct our non, I would like to have the fire chief position named as an officer of the city because he is our incident commander. And if there's ever some accident or disaster, he's going to be in charge. And I believe it's prudent that he be a city officer. And according to section 30.13, municipal judge and officers, the city council may appoint anyone at any time as an officer of the city and designate such powers as we wish for them to have and to perform. So I would like to make that motion with your permission, because we need to have a consensus. I'll second that. So, so I think I think what we actually, but I need to check, but I think what we need to do is a charter amendment. I think that what that refers to is whether it's the judge or the city attorney or the other officers that you would have the ability to point, for instance, you were to fire me and hire another attorney. That would certainly be within your. Um, I don't want to take steps. That would, be, that would certainly be within your purview. But I think I I'd want to take a look and see if if adding a new officer could be done via um, motion, and, and maybe it could, or whether we need a charter amendment, which is usually what we need to do when we're altering the charter. Um. So if Chad and I can get an answer for that, or at least our interpretation. Uh, by the next meeting, and then at that point, um, I think you guys could either do it or at least we know that just we would do it through charter amendment. Okay, that's 30.13, and it's the heading of municipal judge and officers. Okay. And it'll be toward the end of the paragraph. Okay. So this could just be with the other uh, resolution ordinance. Right, so there's there's definitely a way you can do this. We just need to figure out what the what the right way to do it is. But adding adding a position into this is something we can do. I just don't know if we can do it via motion or charter or would require a charter amendment. And the last time we got into this it was when we wanted to add a section to our um, agenda, which is actually specified via your charter. So we're gonna have to do a charter amendment in order to do that, which is why you guys just did it by motion every day. Um, but you guys have some interesting language around your charter amendments. It's my recollection. Unique. Like, okay, so we'll have that on um, the next month's agenda.
them and an answer? Yes. Well, my interpretation. You guys are entitled to discretion and interpreting your insurer. Sure. And just for a note, uh, the fire chief is considered the incident operations uh, commander in any major incidents uh, within your heart. Uh, and that's and treated in this way. It's written up in our emergency operations plan. And for example, during the uh, the airplane into the home, um, Chief Bowman was uh, uh, within that organization, but the fire chief was in charge of the entire scene and the operations. That sort of thing. So, that's so it's operation thing. command and not incident command. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. Same thing. Operation or incident. So uh, depending on what's going on, but sometimes the chief will step back and start taking care of the operations, and then maybe somebody such as a, uh, a captain or somebody in charge of the actual incident. Um, the chief can kind of at his discretion where he is in that. But the main point is he is uh, the chief in charge. Right. Yeah, I think it's also uh, worth noting that throughout COVID, uh, Chief Eddie wore that hat, if you will, uh, in that he was the chief liaison to the public health department um, for the countywide COVID response. That was his job, not Chad's job. I mean, that's just the way that structure works. Yeah, and another thing we can do is also take a look at the way that other cities do for uh, information sake to give us some examples of how they work. Sure. Um, new business, Fanta partition of guilt. So there's one decision that would need to be made uh, this evening. So to inform all the participants of, of how you're going to process this, and it's it's how you're going to receive it. So you have four options, but generally it's three. The, the first is whether you want to do it on the record, which means it's restricted to the record that was in front of the planning commission, and people are restricted to the arguments that they made in front of the planning commission. Uh, the second is limited to the presentation of additional evidence on such issues as you deem necessary. So that would be if there are four issues and you feel one is not fully fleshed out and you would like people to focus on that issue. Um, that does not, that's not an option that comes up a lot because it frankly requires a lot of, it's something that comes up during the first hearing if, if you realize at that point you might need additional information, you should always do that. The third is the NOVA, which means that we start over again. Everyone gets to submit what they want to submit. It's not restricted to the people that participated in the first one, and they're not restricted to the arguments or evidence that they um, were restricted to in the first one. Uh, in Gearhart, we've seen that most often with um, citywide issues, such as the short-term rentals or things that that um, that are legislative in character that, that could influence a lot of um, a lot of property owners and and why the city council has done that in the past is just to ensure that there's that full, full global one participation allowed. Um, it has been used less on uh, an application such as this, but it's certainly the purview to do if you'd like. And I guess if Carol has any uh, thoughts on that, I think she's joining us. Yeah. I, I, so number, number four would actually be Sending it back to the planning commission. Yeah. And that's that's that usually happens again at the hearing if you think there's been an error, omission of law or code. Um, that's generally why it would get remanded to the planning commission. I have a question. Um, so in the appeal documents, um, um, the Bantas have added a lot of information uh, that seems like it would be uh, more in the number two because it seems like there's more information than perhaps the planning commission had i don't know that to be true but just because he's got feedback from people who live there and feedback from the county emails from the county. He's got other 
stuff is there. So, yeah. so is that part of the record now or not part of the record? I guess I'm kind of asking. Right. Yeah. I guess Carol would be the one who could answer that question. Because I didn't stop this preparing. Can you can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I would say uh, that the comments or that the signatures from some of the neighbors is new, as new information. And the statement about the county will never, was it part you said that the county would never build this on their I'll land. Be up, upgrading the McCormick Gardens Road. Well, um, you know, that's not really new information. We don't have jurisdiction in the county and never have. So it's in our 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 TSP to, to do the road in the city. And what the county does or now or possibly in the future um, is really not something that we can get involved in anyway. We would we would upgrade it just in the city. And that's not unusual. See what I mean? So I don't know that that's new information. Um, this maybe it wasn't discussed necessarily, but that's that's just the way it, off, the way it works. And then he brought up um, the issue about getting a sample of a waiver of remonstrance, which the. Planning Commission wasn't involved in that conversation per se. Uh, your code already requires one. And the, the, uh, the follow-up to the hearing was to send, was to provide a copy of a waiver of remonstrance to the applicant so they could see what they were signing and hopefully it would sign. But we the city has never has not used it yet, and we don't have a form. And and so that is not unlikely that we could do that in the process of the final partition. This is a preliminary partition approval that's occurred. Uh, it has to come back for a final approval by the Planning Commission to make sure all the conditions were met. And sometimes that takes months for an applicant to bring a partition <clears throat> back in its final form. I'm not saying it would in this case, but then we would go through the list of items and make sure that everything was in order and take it to the planning mission and say it's ready to be signed and recorded. So the uh, ability for us to develop a waiver of remonstrance in this interim is um, an acceptable way to go just because we need one. The waivers of remonstrance are quite common everywhere and, and so I did send Mr. Banta just a sample of one that I had in my files for another city in Oregon to show him how they operate. And, you know, I think that seemed a little too informal to him the way he commented in this appeal uh, request, but that would all be ironed out in the final plat review as soon as we develop a waiver. I'm not even sure if you know what I'm talking about. A waiver is our code requires street improvements now as a part of the um, transportation system plan and the amendments we made to the code for any land division or any land development. And the, but the city also has the option to not require the improvements to waive them, either pay a fee in lieu of at the generally at the cost of what that improvement would be or waive and defer the improvement to a time in the future when the city could form a local improvement district for uh, majority of the property owners on that same street uh, to, for the city to make the improvement and every person with frontage that has a waiver would be required to pay their fair share. Now, so where you see it most often is in some cities that have been opted undergrounding for power um, or sidewalks, and then new house on the block is developed. Some cities you'll actually see the power underground for the one property and go back up, or you'll see an orphan sidewalk 
that's in the middle of the block. And then in other cities, that's when a majority of the lots um, either, so there's then no remonstrance and the agreement is that when the triggering event happens, then at that point they have to construct it. So it's to prevent that kind of orphaning, which most people think, I think the general consensus is that's a more efficient way to do the sidewalk for the entire street versus one lot at a time. Um, so that's, it, that's, our code allows for that. Um, it's not something that's come up in the past, but we will develop. It, it's actually, it's state statutes kind of dictate what's in it. Um, it gets recorded. So then future property owners have noticed that if the triggering event happens, they have to build it. And the fee and Lou is used by Portland and other cities. And that's the same instance, but instead of them agreeing that they'll build it, on the trigger event, they pay in the money now, and then it gets built once the number of properties along the block have all paid in in order to cause it to be efficient to build it for the block. So those those are two very commonly used um, elements where you have something required for one lot and then the rest of the house is the block and have it. Yeah, and Peter, I, I don't know if you've had different experience than I have, but I've never seen a local improvement district ever even formed using yeah, the I did I did one in Dundee um, related to Highway 99 uh, that you know we the, the benefit of the LID is that the property owners if they're required to do it they can bankrupt on it which is they pay over 10 years versus having to pay for the cost up front. Um, it's usually the property owners themselves that approach the city because they either want sidewalks or they want the other amenities. And it gives the city the ability to give them um, municipal bond rates, which are generally really favorable uh, over that kind of period of time. So I did one in Dundee, I did one in Tiger, I believe. I can't think of another one, but I've got stuff somewhere. City of Seaside went through one. About uh, 2003 or four, I'm thinking. I moved here in 05, so it was my, during my planning commission time there. So Kevin Couples is familiar with it. And it's usually for the extreme improvements, so paving or sidewalk improvements is where you see it most often. Yeah, we're on a road in 12th Avenue in Seaside. The good news is it's chaired by majority. If you can get a majority of the property owners to vote for the LID, then the minority are all stuck with the costs. <laughs> Fortunately, it's probably not good to take a public. <laughs> They're a bad <laughs> The one hold out on the block has to pay. <laughs> is there a consensus which direction we should go at this point? Or are there more questions? I would go with number one if I had a choice. That's what I was leaning towards. That's how you would process these most commonly in the past. So this sort of uh, property specific application, the city council in your is generally processed as on the record. So that's not an unusual deviation at all. I'm fine with that. Okay. On the record. On the record. So we're choosing number one. Thank you. Search into the record page and the decision being. Uh, we're past nine o'clock, so I'm going to skip feedback session and go right on to council concerns. Dan Jesse. I'll save my concerns for next one. My only, I just have a question. If it's regarding the playground equipment, what is the earliest that you can see that the playground equipment would be in place? Summer's almost getting over. Well, I will refer to what 
uh, Madam Mayor has talked about that because of the loss of the school system, that we wanted to get this done sooner than later, later and possibility of having this project, you know, at least begin or come to fruition prior to the parks master planning uh, being completely finished is a possibility. So we'll look at the, the costs. I haven't been able to go through that to see what our funding gap might be. But um, the, the political nature of this is as soon as possible, from what I understand. Would that be a good explanation, Madam Mayor? I think we want to move forward as quickly as we can. Thanks. They have playground museums. <laughs> Does that equipment exist? Or does it have to be manufactured? Do we know? Uh, my understanding, I, well, I think Christy be able to answer this. She says more communication with that. I'm not sure that there is a long backlog other than what would typically be normal these days. How does that work? <laughs> Which is what, 12 to 25 weeks? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Christy may know some more about that, uh, but, but I'm sure there will be times at this point. We can find out on this show. If you want to build a house next year, you want to order your windows now. Got it. Chad? Yes, ma'am. Hello. She's had told us, well, at least Buell Recreation, that their normal lead time was four to six weeks, but right now, ever since COVID, it was more like six to eight weeks. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, Rita, uh, Kerry? I have a uh, concern. Um, I just found out earlier from Peter that uh, the, D, the LCDC goal number one and two is uh, the most important. And I'd like to bring it up for discussion next month since it says there and number five, that uh, we are to maintain a recording of every meeting in City Hall and a written record for citizens. And I'd like to discuss that, that we make it part of the normal process of our meetings, that we have a recording and it's public record that people can get, of course, not the executive sessions, but if that's what Peter said was true, and you look at deal LCDC goal one and two citizen involvement, it says on five that we have to maintain a recording record. So I'd like to discuss that next week so we can make a motion to make that part of our process of transparency. We can discuss that next month. Uh, goal one is the public participation, goal two, um, which is not in the same heightened category is the coordination among different agencies and governments. Okay. So the goal one is the public participation. That's specifically in the land context of land use um, hearings and matters. So or in land use law. But then we can have a we can have a discussion about that. Okay, great. Yeah. And just so you know, in all meetings that we do here in council chambers with the city council, the planning commission, other day work session or formal meeting is recorded. So there are some possibilities. So there are recordings that someone can access if they need to. Well, they can ask us for them. They're not easily accessible. They're not accessible on the website at all. And that's something that we can discuss to see how we can do that. These files are quite large, but maybe a Dropbox scenario or sure. something like that. Uh, but when they are requested, we give them out. Okay. So are these, like, they used to be a tape and now they're digital or what are they? What you see right up here on the screen and everything that we're saying is recorded just like this. Everybody's face, every picture, and all things that are said are recorded like that. So when we do the, um, the minutes, we're actually able to watch this video again. Yeah, like we yeah. just. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it used to be on tape, cassette tape. Right. Well, and, and then actually we had a digital recorder or a little bit digital recorder. We, we thumb drive them, we keep them secure in the safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, previously we had done CDs. Right, yeah. yeah. I've had CDs. But this information is too much too large for a CD now. 
So it would be thumb drives and thumb drives are inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there still a concern or are we doing what you're yeah, asking? We're going to talk about it next month. And if it's what I think it is, because I read it right here just now, then uh, we'll be recording and having a recording available for the public. And that's basically all it is is transparency. But we already have that. So why do we need to discuss like we already it? Have it? Oh, well, then, I mean, I'll drop that. It's just, I was told that we weren't recording an executive session because we didn't have to. Well, we have to record it. It isn't open for the public to see, but we have to re maintain a recording. So for the rule with the public meetings laws um, related to a public meeting is that you can have a recording of it or you can have written minutes um, and or written minutes. We do both. Um, and if you do written minutes only versus also having a tape, then it has to, the statute plays out what it is. It's who's present. It specifies what they said. I mean, these minutes, the minutes that we have this one, they're great. I mean, we, we've got great minutes. They certainly comply with all the state statutes. With the executive sessions, it's a little bit different. Um, there actually is not a requirement that we record it, but we do have to have minutes. And those minutes do have to say, um, at a minimum, uh, who is present. It has to give the public meetings an exception um, that we did the executive session under. So whether it's you know a property purchase or if there are a variety of ones. And then, as you guys know, technically you're not allowed to vote in the executive session. So you can you can provide some guidance. It's not binding, but we have to come out of the executive session. And then you, if you want to authorize something, then that would have to happen during a regular meeting. And so those minutes then, the regular portion, the regular meeting portion of that, so going into the executive session would need to be recorded um, per our own, how we do things. So the executive session, we need that minimum written information. And then when we come out of that, we would want that to be recorded as well, just under how we do things, which is recorded and the minutes. So the executive session part, what's required and that's a little bit different. And again, if we just wanted to do written minutes for um, our meetings, we could, but because we're already recording the meetings so that we can do the written minutes, I mean, why wouldn't we make the, you know, the recording available if someone wants it on the flash drive? Um, and that's, that's what we do per request. And I don't know how much data we would need to put that on our website or if there's a not really great with technology or if there's some way to archive it but there there probably is well we can do it yeah. and currently that's for a request that you made some time ago and since the council we do record record the entirety of the executive session to keep them they would be recorded like this because you know, this is available anyway, right but uh, we do it with a uh, voice recorder okay so you can record those well, I inquired about an executive session, but I was told there was no recording of it. That, that, that has happened. That and that's that. one of the reasons why I want to talk about this and get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not our intention to do that. Yeah. Okay. And my big concern got alleviated um, the access to pilot money. Ready to say it's a dead deal because we didn't have access to high money. Now that we do, I'm good to go. Okay, anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? I actually have a concern. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the you know, the, the Alpha Prevention. Um, so the, the Elk Collaborative update, and I remember when ODF and W was here. They were here the same as Mr. Johnson. It was four or five years ago. And basically what they told us we needed was a survey of the herd or herds to determine the number of elk, um, to record the elk's impact on urban areas because those ODF and W individuals didn't appear to think that urban areas were the right place for Roosevelt elk. And then, um, and then if after we got that data, we would, there were options available at 
after they described the various options, which I think they call processing, uh, Senator Johnson said, you know, I can get probably get funds for Jack Freezer for the um, for the uh, folks that need help with with meals, uh, food bank, etc. Um, one of my concerns with the update that we got last time that they wanted us to sign was it was both kind of binding and non-binding and had a lot of undefined things, but it also lacked all of the initial information that we were told initially by ODF and W that they would require. And it in fact didn't even have the best practices for ODF and W. So as I look at the bullet items that say, um, review the draft declaration of cooperation for committee approval and review the budgetary needs for the community to move forward with tasks. I guess one of my questions is, are those tasks going to be the tasks that we were told by the FNW we would need in order to determine what our options are going forward? And two, um, I had substantial concerns from the land use perspective when they were talking about us agreeing to help fencing, which when I researched that, that's 14 feet high metal fencing, as well as an help corridor. Um, those do not seem to be within what, what I believe has been articulated in the past as kind of the gear our character. Um, and also, um, you know, that can create a lot of appeals. So uh, I just, I would just say as this moves forward, if, if the goal of this, what's now like in year three of the process, if it was to do those things that we were told by ODF and W, then maybe that be mentioned. And if they're ongoing costs, then I wonder if those will be part of it or what will be part of it. Uh, because what we got a few months ago and what I was expecting to get were so sort of diametrically different that I would like to flag it. And, um, and uh, that's all I'll say. <laughs> 14 foot fences they were these black metal 14 foot fences and i just thought oh boy i know how that's going to go if uh, we were to say that the fencing in your heart would involve elk fence so and that was one of the things that it said was that fencing would be a colorado does that um at that direction of colorado and in state owned wilderness areas so the golf course would become a prison? I, I mean, I was just, there were a lot of words there, and I'm reading them, and the problem is when I read words and think, think like, oh, corridor, and then I think about a subdivision coming in, and somebody says, well, you can't build a subdivision because that's the health corridor, and the council has agreed to maintain the health corridor, that's an automatic loop appeal. And at that point, we're trying to prove a negative, which is that it's not the health corridor. And so I totally get the spirit of cooperation that Oregon Solutions has tried to bring about. And I totally appreciate the spirit of collaboration, but like words have meaning, and this is Gerhardt. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. And so, you know, easiest problem to solve is probably going to happen. I move we adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Good time to hear. Well, who seconded? I did. Okay. Thank you. Congrats. I'm sending you. Do you want me to call into tomorrow's meeting? I go like that. Hey. That's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not doing anything that we didn't put on our little.